the nerds. In this video, we're gonna be going over all the top apps that I use in my job as a data analyst that I've accumulated over the years. So the first apps we're gonna be covering are gonna revolve around the top analytical tools. Specifically, go to my app, datanerd.tech. It aggregates the top skills in job postings for data nerds. Right here, I have it listed for data analysts. In it, we have SQL as the most important tool, followed by Excel, Python, Tableau, Power BI, and then R. We're gonna be going into all of them, but let's start with Excel first, because it was the first tool that I learned. Now, unless you've been living underneath a rock, Excel is a spreadsheet software from Microsoft. Now, you also have other competitors that make similar spreadsheet software, such as Google, LibreOffice, and even Apple. But none of them are as popular as Microsoft Excel, and that's mainly due to the fact of the Microsoft ecosystem that many businesses have adapted. Now, if your company or school is not providing you with a Microsoft license, you'll need to purchase one. I currently mooch off my brother and get a family plan in order to access Microsoft Excel. This subscription provides access to other popular tools like Microsoft Word and PowerPoint that I do find myself having to use as well. Now, Microsoft does offer a free version of Excel, but it's only with Excel for the web. And this version of Excel is very limiting and a lot of the capabilities that you're gonna need as a data analyst aren't included in this, so I don't really recommend it. Now, Excel is going to be different depending on the operating system that you install it on. Right here, I'm on a MacBook and I can download Microsoft Excel into my Mac. However, using Excel inside of Mac OS is very limiting. Specifically, you don't have access to things like VBA, Power Query, and then also the new feature of Python in Excel. So I don't recommend this is how you use Excel as a data analyst on a Mac. Instead, I run a virtual machine inside of my Mac. And so it's running Windows locally. And this allows me to access the Windows version of Microsoft Excel inside my Mac. Now I have an affiliate link below for my favorite virtual machine, which is Parallels. You can do it for either a one-time purchase of $130 right now, or use their subscription model so that way you get updates to Parallels. Now I like Parallels because it has this feature of coherence mode, and this allows me to access Microsoft applications inside of my Mac OS. I can just go in and select things like Power BI Desktop, and it's gonna load right into my Mac OS. And now this gets into the age old question of whether you should get a Mac or get a PC. And I can make a whole video about it, which I have here, you can check it out. I'll give you the shortened version of it. If you need anything, get a PC. It's gonna be able to handle all the different apps you're gonna need as a data analyst, and you're not gonna have to use these workarounds like Parallel in order to get certain things to work. Trust me, it'll save you time and money. All right, next up on the list is SQL. And I didn't cover this one first because, well, Frankly, it's a little complicated. Now SQL, which stands for Structured Query Language, is the programming language in order to communicate with the database. The complexity with SQL is that there are a host of different databases that you can choose from or that a company may use. Personally, I've used databases like SQL Server, Postgres, and even BigQuery. Now these databases where the data is stored is located in either two locations. One, locally, and that's usually for something like training or development or most likely it's located up in the cloud. And if so, I'm accessing something like BigQuery, I can just log into something like Google Cloud and then access it through a web browser. I can even go as far as querying the database, but that's a cloud-based database. What happens if we're working with something more open source like Postgres or MySQL? Well, these type of databases allow you to download their individual software programs that then allow you to connect to these Postgres or MySQL databases whether it be on your machine or on another server. For example, with Postgres, I have two different applications. The first one has all the different databases in it, and I can start up this application and start up different databases to run locally. From there, I can use Postgres software, PG Admin, which you access through a web browser. And with this, I can then access the database and run queries to connect to this database. Again, locally or even on a server. Similarly, if I'm using something like SQL Server, I can use their software, SQL Server Management Studio, and from there actually query a SQL Server database. But there's a video on top apps that I'm recommending as a data analyst. So am I saying you need to download all the different databases and also all the different applications to actually query those databases? No, not at all. Instead, I would recommend downloading something like dBeaver, which is something I've used in the past in order to access a host of different databases. Oh, and this tool is completely free. It not only supports the top three databases of MySQL, SQL Server, and Postgres, but also a host of other ones as well. 
And this application, which works on both Mac and Windows, allows you to connect to databases and even goes as far as visualizing it. Now, another option for accessing a database through an application is VS Code, but I don't recommend this for beginners. Now, VS Code, which is a code editor from Microsoft and is completely free, allows you to go in and actually run SQL queries and get your results. The problem with this is it's more designed for programming languages like Python and Java, and doesn't necessarily have in mind what you need to set you up for success to run SQL queries. So that's why I don't recommend it as much for beginners. All right, moving on to Python, which is the second language after SQL that I'd recommend learning. Now, Python is a multi-purpose programming language. We can use it from anything from web scraping to data visualization. It can even go as far as machine learning, but we're gonna stay away from that for this video. With Python, you need two things to get it working on your machine. First, you need to actually install the core language of Python on it. And two, you need a code editor in order to actually write your Python code to then interact with data or whatever it may be. Now to get Python, you can go to something like python.org and download it for free, but I don't necessarily recommend this for data nerds. Instead, I'm gonna recommend something called the Anaconda distribution, which also is a free download, but it not only includes Python, it also includes a host of other different packages and libraries that are perfect for data nerds. With this distribution installed, you can then get this fancy GUI right here that allows you to access Python via a multitude of options. Things like Jupyter Lab, Spider, and even PyCharm. But personally, I like to use VS Code. Visual Studio Code is completely free and you can download it on Mac or Windows or even Linux. Now, the reason why I'm using VS Code for both SQL and Python revolves around convenience. I have an application that's designed not only to run all my Python code, but also go as far as to run SQL queries. Now, the secret reason why I'm using VS Code is because I rely heavily on GitHub Copilot, which is an AI assistant to help me and speed up my programming. I can just prompt it something like find out the number of rows in this database, providing the name of the table. From there, it generates the code that's needed. And from there, I just run the cell and get the results that I needed. I've become lazy AF in my older age. GitHub Copilot, like most AI chatbots in this day and age, are is not free. Right now, I'm paying $100 for the entire year, and it's worth every single penny for the time it saves me. All right, let's skip on down to the bottom of the list and go with the last programming language, R. I'm not gonna lie, I haven't used R in years. Now, I'm not dissing on it. I think it's a great programming language, especially for statistical analysis. But I find myself wanting to go beyond that, and so that's why I rely on Python. For this language, similar to Python, you need to go through two steps. First, you need to install the language itself on your computer. And then secondly, you need to install the app to actually run R, which I'm gonna recommend R Studio. It's the most popular option. Unlike in other programming communities where there's a fight over all the different coding editors used, the community at R pretty much agrees that this is the best editor for this programming language. Last thing on R, I think it's a great programming language, especially for beginners. Even Google Data Analytics Certificate is teaching their students about this language. So if you're starting out, don't get too deterred with the fight between Python and R. Pick one and go. All right, the last two tools on the list are Tableau and Power BI, which are both visualization tools. For both these tools, they provide a dashboard-like environment for you to build for others to actually go to and mess around and play with different data. When the MacBook M1 chips came out, I made this dashboard right here to go through and actually compare the different prices for different models of the MacBooks. For Tableau, you have two options. One is the free version via Tableau Public, but it's limited in what data can connect to. The other is the actual official corporate version of Tableau that usually companies are paying for and you connect to a host of different databases. If you're just starting out, I recommend just downloading Tableau Public. Now this version is limited. You can only connect to a few different types of data sources. So if you have something like a SQL database, which I find is most commonly what I connect to with Tableau for my job, you're not gonna be able to do it with this version. But if you're starting out, heck, this is good enough. Now, if you need to connect to something like a database or you wanna work and share your work with others, then you're gonna need the official version of Tableau. And this bad boy ain't cheap. Companies that I've worked for in the past have paid for the licenses for Tableau, so I've never really had to pay for it myself. Once you get it connected, you can connect to a host of different sources. With that public, you're connecting to the files. And then inside it, you can use a drag and drop type environment to build your different visualizations to share with whoever. Now, although I'm partial towards Power BI, Overall, I think Tableau may be a better option for beginners to data analytics. Specifically with Tableau Public, which is free, it allows you to then upload your dashboards that you build 
to the community inside of Tableau Public. So you can not only view different dashboards for inspiration, you could sometimes even go in as far as go in and download it. So moving on to Power BI, which as you guessed by now is my favorite. Now this application is free to download from Microsoft's website. And I say free in quotes because there's different catches for pricing behind it. Similar to Tableau, when you get into a corporate environment and need to start actually sharing your dashboards with other, it starts to cost money. Although I find not as much as Tableau, it costs money nonetheless. Which for the app itself, you don't need to pay any money for, but similar to Microsoft Excel, it only works in a Windows environment. So here again, on my MacBook, I'm using that Parallels virtual machine in order to access Power BI. Very similar to Tableau, it provides a drag and drop type environment for you to go in and actually build your different visualizations for your stakeholder. From there, if you have a license, you can then publish these dashboards to the Power BI service. All right, there's one more app that I'd add to this list of analytical tools that I think you should be using as an analyst. For this, we need to go to another survey, specifically the 2023 developer survey from Stack Overflow. They surveyed over 90,000 developers asking them what are the most important apps and tools they use on a daily basis. And a tool that I'm finding that I'm using throughout the day, multiple hours, is an AI search tool. Specifically, some of the top choices right now are things like ChatGPT, Bing, and Bard. Not sure why Claude didn't make the list, but it's also a popular option as well. Anyway, ChatGPT tops this list and it's my go-to search tool. You can access ChatGPT on your web browser or even on your phone, which is pretty cool. There's three different versions of ChatGPT, free plus an enterprise. Free as well free, and it's very limited, and I don't find it that useful for my job as a data analyst. Plus is the version I go with as it has things like advanced data analysis and access to plugins. And then finally, enterprise is something a company would supply you if you needed to work with confidential or restricted data, this would handle that. I have a couple different use cases of ChatGPT. The first is just a basic query engine. If I get stuck on a problem, whether that's coding or Excel, I just go right to this tool and query it and it gives me the answer. The other reason why I use this tool is for quick ad hoc analysis. I can provide it a data set and it can quickly dive into analyzing and providing insights from it. I can even go as far as providing it visualizations and it show me insights from the graphs that are provided. Okay, for the rest of this video, we're not gonna be covering any more analytical tools. Instead, we're gonna be focusing on tools that I'm using that help me actually complete my job. First up is asynchronous tools. These type of tools are great for helping teams collaborate different times and different locations. Out of all these on the list, I'm partial towards Notion. This app allows me to keep record of all the different ideas and notes I have. As you can see here, I have the script for this video. But the powerful thing about Notion is that it's not only great for keeping my notes, but it's also great with working with others. Here I have a Notion page for the members of my team to go to and it has access to a bunch of different resources. It helps me with sharing the work with my team as here I have a database of scripts and you can just go into one of it and actually see what I'm working on. Now I've also used this app in order to share any of my analytical findings. It's a great way to actually put in different graphs and write your insights next to it and then share it with your team. So there's a multitude of different options you can use it. Now Notion comes with free and also paid plans. If you're an individual starting out, the free plan is gonna be good enough. Personally with me and having a team, I use the plus version. Additionally, I've recently upgraded to use Notion AI as its own personal little chat GPT assistant right inside of Notion. Since we talked about asynchronous tools, we also need to talk about synchronous tools, which allow me to interact with other people and my teammates in real time. I've used things like Microsoft Teams, Slack, and Zoom in the past, but I'll be honest, the funnest one that I love is Discord. Discord is free and you can get it on things like PC or Mac or even your phone. Inside Discord, you can have different servers. For me, I have my own Luke Baru server where all my teammates can go to. With this, I can control all the different sections that are within my server, and so we can control the discussions on where they should be had. The other great thing about Discord is there's a bunch of different free and also paid servers that you can join of like-minded individuals. Now, I don't have a public server for anybody to join. Although, if you think I should, hit me up in the comments. But my friend Sven over at Coding is Fun has his own server that he makes public and you can join it. You can not only get notified about his uploads, but you can also go to places to actually talk with other people that have the similar interests. All right, we're gonna get into a bit of a speed round to wrap up these last few apps. First is a terminal. I'm frequently using this with Python and this allows me to programmatically interact with my computer on the back end. I use it from everything from managing version control with Git to even accessing my database in the cloud. On Mac, I use iTerm2, which is free to download. 
If I'm inside of Windows, I'm using a similar app called Windows Terminal, which is also free. The nice thing about Windows Terminal though, is it allows me to access a multitude of different types of terminals, including PowerShell, Command Prompt, and here I got Azure Cloud Shell. Now I mentioned version control and using things like the command line to interact with Git, but I find, especially for newbies, if you're using something like GitHub to manage your version control, GitHub Desktop is an app you wanna have. It's completely free and it allows you to access all of your different repositories and keep track of all the different changes within it in a very easy to use user interface. Next up is Grammarly, and this is like spell check on steroids. The most common way to use this is inside your web browser, but you can also use it in things like Microsoft Word. With it, it provides recommendations on not only spelling, but also on helping you rewrite your wording to make you sound more clear. I'm using it to proofread everything before I send out, even things like my LinkedIn posts. Now Grammarly has a few different versions that you can get. You can either get the free, which I feel is sort of limited for my needs, so I actually pay for it using the premium version. This one comes down to $12 a month, it makes me not sound like a babbling idiot, so I think it's worth the money. All right, the last app we're gonna be talking about is a screenshot and also video recording app. And this is how I capture visualizations for LinkedIn and also for any presentations I have to give. And unfortunately, this is the only app on the list that is Mac specific. And it costs either $8 a month or just do like me and pay one time of $29. With this app, I can do things like just screenshot a graph that I wanna take and from there go into edit mode. I can add a border around it if I want, adjust the sizing of it. If there's less relevant information, I can go ahead and blur that out. If I wanna annotate on the graph, I can just draw a little arrow. I can even include a caption. And this tool has been great at saving me time of getting the screenshots I need and curating them down to what I need them for. All right, that's a bunch of different apps that we went through, but I find that I'm using these on a daily basis. And so I hope you get benefit out of this as well. As always, if you got value out of this video, smash that like button. And with that, I'll see you in the next one.